Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session starting at the beginning. We are very excited to have you all here with us. And uh, just a little bit of housekeeping things. I think we agreed that we would keep all questions in the chat um, for the end. So if you have questions as we're going through, please just post them in the chat and we'll make sure we address those first. Um, but we're hoping to reserve some time at the end for conversation as we know how important that is to the OER movement and, and being part of this, this meeting today is another step forward for us as we are starting at the beginning and building new programs at MLC with OER in mind. So before we get started in what we're building, let's talk to you about a little bit about where we are and what we're doing. So Martin Luther College is a small private college charged with preparing individuals to serve in the public ministry of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. So that means that we have a very specific focus within our mission, but it also means we have a very specific focus within our academic programs. We offer degrees in education uh, to prepare individuals to teach in our early childhood centers, our elementary schools, and our secondary or high schools. We have a program in staff ministry to prepare individuals to support the ministry of our congregations. And we also have a ministry in pre-seminary programming to prepare individuals who are going on for our pastor track at our seminary in Wisconsin. Uh, and then finally, we also offer graduate, which is almost entirely online, but does offer some synchronous sessions and non-credit programs, which are also almost entirely online, but do offer some synchronous in-person sessions. So we have a very tightly focused, narrowly focused institutional mission, and we're meeting that institutional mission with some very specific programming that we've provided. And that's guiding everything that we do within the programs we're developing, but it's also guiding everything that we do within our day to day work. And with that, we'll introduce ourselves to you. My name is Linda Cromer, and I'm the director of library services. This is my 10th year at MLC. And I work with a staff of four other librarians and several student workers. Uh, and I am Dr. Nicole Legro. I am the director of our non traditional education program. I joined MLC this January, so I'm about 10 months into my role. And uh, I have been charged or called to help develop or spearhead developing, I should say, our new programs that we're designing specifically for returning adult learners. And that's really what has led us to our OER challenge. Um, so as I came on board in January, I knew that I would be working with faculty across the board to develop specific programs. And I knew as I was doing that, that I wanted to make sure that uh, we were focusing on incorporating OER into that course design process from the beginning. Uh, I have experience with OER as an instructor. I've used it in classes that I've taught, and I've also been involved with UW Green Bay's OER initiative prior to joining Martin Luther College. So OER is not new to me. And when I came um, to MLC, one of the first people I met with was Linda to say, hey, what do you think about doing all of this with OER? And we really are doing all of this with OER because of the programs we're creating. So as we were moving forward and wrestling with these questions, it really became clear um, that with the two programs we're creating for returning adult learners, it really is important for us to leverage OER as much as possible. So the two courses of study we are creating are a CBTE, which is a competency-based theological education minor, and our Apple, which is the alternative pathway to professional licensure eligibility. It took us far too long to come up with that. Um, but our Apple Elementary Education Program. Both of these programs are focused on providing a pathway for those individuals who are already connected with our congregations or our schools to become teachers in our schools. They must complete the CBTE coursework with us. They can't complete that anywhere else at any other college or institution. That is all about who we are and what we believe. Uh, but the education courses, they could complete someplace else. So we wanted to make sure that we were really designing these courses and these programs with the intention of supporting those students from the beginning so that everything that they have when they're in the courses with us are resources they can continue to use after 
they have graduated and are actually in their public ministry field. For our CBTE program, we're completely reinventing that program. It, it currently exists as six distinct courses that individuals take over the course of their studies, and we're making it a year-long holistic program that pulls resources from across the board. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those resource, resources are as we move through our presentation. Um, but we're really building that also around Regent University's net approach to curriculum and course design, which focuses on the narrative. Um, so thinking of leading the students through a story or leading the students through um, a, a concept by approaching it as a holistic view of what it is we want them to learn and gain over time, incorporating engagement throughout that course design, and then transformation, which includes a lot of metacognition and reflection, which is important for someone going into the public ministry. And then our Apple elementary education program is based on licensure standards and our existing course structure. So it's a one to one correlation, whatever course they would take. If they were here as an undergrad, a traditional undergrad, they will take online in a competency based model with the same assessments and same curriculum, um, but different resources because we're going to leverage OER. So as we began our conversation, and again, Linda was one of the first people I saw at Allen on campus, and he said, hi, I'm Nicole, and we're going to work together, and she graciously agreed. Um, but we decided that as we're building out our OER and AER into the programs we're building, we needed to create specific steps from the beginning. First being an OER team, uh, and then consistently focusing on and discussing and we meet monthly to have those conversations about our faculty support and training and resources that we're developing for them and then the curation of the resources as well. So we're going to share a little bit about each one of those steps with you um, over the next few slides. So our OER team really is very small but very mighty right now and we're hoping that as our program builds itself um, and we, as we work with the faculty in building the program we have more faculty who are interested in being part of the OER movement on our campus and potentially expand our OER team but here's what we have right now our OER team focuses on um, myself and, and Linda as we're working to develop and facilitate faculty training and resources and really thinking about how to coordinate efforts across our two teams uh, and then our <clears throat> Linda and our instructional designer and our library staff identify and curate resources. Uh, and they're really working together to develop what that might look like. And then our instructional designer and the faculty will incorporate OER or AR into their course design process um, by including the librarian, most likely Linda or one of the other members of her staff in their initial meeting to talk about what is this going to look like and how might we leverage this resource, these resources that are available for us. So once that um, group has kind of come together and curated those resources, we identified some specific needs we had from the beginning. And these specific needs drove what we considered when we were designing and developing some of our initial faculty to support and training resources. And we really are at the beginning stages of this, so we haven't fully fleshed out uh, all of the resources, but there are some things we'd like to share with you today. So what have we learned uh, about our faculty support and training? Uh, it is really, really, really important for us to make sure that we are designing all of our faculty support and training with a mind of who our faculty are. Um, and right now, as we're focusing on our CBTE minor, most of our faculty are theologians. They are pastors. They are people who have come in from being a, from the field of being a pastor to being a teacher on our campus, a professor on our campus. And they are a, a group of individuals who like to read and they like to read a lot and they like to dissect what they read. So we've focused on creating a brief handout, which we'll share with you um, to inform faculty about OER in advance of the course design. So as we're working with the faculty, this is kind of like their first taste of what OER is, uh, and that allows them to engage then in conversation with us, uh, with our instructional designer about what OER is and what OER is available there. Uh, and Linda is going to talk a little bit about some of the resources that we've been able to curate. 
So we we're on a campus where a lot of things have been done traditionally over time. And while a few people on campus are familiar with OER and have used some open textbooks and things in their classes, uh, there hasn't been a big push for OER. And even though I've learned uh, at conferences and things like that about some OER movements across the country, it's not something I had worked with directly on campus. So when Nicole came to me with this idea, uh, at first I was a little apprehensive uh, that we would find enough things that would support what it is that we need to do to accomplish the goals of these programs. Uh, but as, as we dove into it and as she kind of shared some of the things that she knew about, uh, we were able to start the process of curating, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, but before we talk a bit more about curating those resources, uh, we really have intentionally in included OER in the course design by incorporating the librarian at the kickoff meeting when we have our meeting with the faculty to develop their course uh, in the new design program. Um, and also making sure that we're encouraging them and supporting them and helping them find resources if they have questions. And ultimately, although we're not there yet, we fully intend to assess the OER with our content delivery through opportunities for learners to provide feedback as they're going through their course resources that they found useful resources that they found on their own that they think we should consider, but then also instructor feedback as well. What was missing or what resources did they find themselves seeking out as they were preparing for their synchronous meetings or as they were preparing for a specific lesson that they were going to deliver that they want to make sure that we incorporate into a future design of the course. So before I get too far off this page, I just wanted to very quickly pop over to the OER bookmark. So hopefully everything works um, and I'm able to do that. So let me change my share um, and see if I can get it to come up. So um, this is again, just a bookmark. Um, we've actually made two of them just so that we can connect people with resources from the beginning as they're working through their initial, thoughts or initial exploration of OER. Again, knowing that our faculty have not really used or leveraged OER pervasively on our campus. Uh, and so it's an easy way to introduce them to some of those concepts that are familiar to those who have used OER for a while. All right. And with that, we're gonna dive into some more conversation about our resource curation. And I'm gonna adjust the camera so Linda's centered. So the picture on this slide is, is of part of our library. And as you can see, we have a lot of print materials. Uh, we've been even uh, probably slower than some educational institutions to move to uh, digital resources. So we're, that's the context that we're coming from as we develop these resources. So as we started thinking about what are we going to do to curate OER, you know, some goals came to mind. We need to do we need to find things that are logical for the, the learners that we have and the faculty that we're working with. We need to find things that are beneficial for the learners and the faculty, uh, appropriate to their level, to their requirements, uh, supportive of the learning goals that they have, uh, finding the right amount. And this might be one of the biggest tricks of all is uh, not too much, but not too little so that it's an appropriate amount. Uh, one of the goals we have is to really have these be ongoing resources so that even when they're done with their degrees here, uh, they'll have these materials that they're familiar with that they can continue to use as they're out in their, their classrooms as they're teaching. And then trying to develop these materials so that the these online learners have uh, an equality and an equity with the people the traditional students who are on campus. So those are some of the things that we're trying to think of as we curate these resources. And we had to think about a platform and as we curate these, what are we going to use? Uh, because this is new to us, we didn't want to jump into an entirely new platform um, besides finding the new resources and working with the new resources. So we're using something that we've dabbled with in the past. We haven't really fully developed it, but it seems to lend itself well, at, especially at this beginning stage of, of for using the, the OER and curating the OER. Nicole, can you bring up the example? So this is a, a platform called Subjects Plus. It's similar to 
LibGuides that a lot of libraries use, but it's an open source product. And our campus uh, IT is, is very supportive of using open source things. One of the things that I like about this is that we can, uh, as probably in LibGuides too, you can set the resources and then link them in several different pages so that if you need to make a change, you only make it in one place. And that makes it more user friendly uh, to the students and to the librarians who are developing it than to have to change links in multiple places. Uh, it's not pretty right now. We uploaded this, um, began using this site, I think in 2016, um, and we're, we're in talks now about developing it to look better, uh, be a little more modernized, but right now we're just loading content into it. And then we'll, we'll look at, uh, as the program develops, we'll have it um, kind of match the look of other campus pages and things so that it flows better for the students. Some of the challenges that we've had are finding the good stuff. And for us, especially with the theology minor, that's finding resources that, uh, that reflect our particular theology. So it's not um, finding things about the Bible in general as much as finding the things that, that will support the things that the students are learning in their classes. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. And I, I know this is a challenge with OER everywhere is how many different places do open educational resources live? How do you find them without searching all of those sites? It, it kind of reminds me in some ways of going back to when I was uh, doing my undergraduate work and you had to search all of the different databases separately. So how do we how do we find those things? How do we bring them together so that we are not starting from scratch and we make use of the things that are already out there that make sense for us? Again, finding that right amount so that it's not overwhelming for the students and especially as we support the faculty to not have them, um, because this is a new, this is a whole new process for them. So there's a big learning curve as far as that goes. So we want to provide the right amount of information so that they don't have an overwhelming amount of new resources to, to look at and identify. Um, and there haven't been maybe a lot of things written about what are best practices in curating. Uh, as we have our conversation at the end of the slides, I'd be interested to hear, uh, you know, what what resources do you have or, or what best practices are out there as far as curating or sharing or finding these resources? Uh, we realize that even though our goal is to have these be lasting things that are available even after the students are done with their coursework at MLC, we may not be able to provide all of that. So are there some other solutions that we can find? Um, maybe some DRM free materials that can be downloaded while they're students and used later. Uh, maybe uh, getting students good at searching and assessing whether resources that are created in the future are good for their functions. And then will we develop some things on our own? And maybe we'll use our core of student workers who are all training for ministry or teaching um, to use some of the skills and the things that they're learning to develop things for their fellow, fellow learners. So how did we get to the point that we're at now? Uh, we did have a little bit of the beginnings of this kind of thinking during COVID. When the students weren't here to get materials physically from the library and we thought, how do we get them the information they need? So that was some of it, uh, mailing, uh, mailing items out to them, getting special copyright permission to make copies and things. But again, looking for those pieces that were freely available and could be used. Uh, we've we've been using Subjects Plus for a few years, and so it wasn't totally new in how to use it. Uh, it was just a new way of thinking, how will we organize things within it? We have been slowly increasing our use of eBooks on campus. So that made it um, that going to a digital, primarily digital resource basis won't be entirely new for us. And then for our graduate programs, which are entirely online, we had already been thinking about how do we have that parity between our, our traditional on-campus learners and their library resources and those that are available to the online learners. Who are we supporting? We're supporting the students in the program, but
but also, especially at the beginning, we're really supporting the faculty um, because they're learning to use new resources. We'll do some additional curation to kind of give them the best of the best so that they don't have to do a lot of sifting. We'll kind of help them through that. And then the instructional designer is also uh, very involved with this and has lists of OER resources that he can he can provide some guidance if we kind of hit a wall. And what if we don't find enough? Uh, we may have to go to library subscriptions and purchases and having some things that are only available while there's students here on campus. And we'll have to make that very clear to them which things are available just while they're enrolled and which are available long term. Uh, we can develop some own, uh, some things of our own, but of course that takes time and money, uh, which are which are resources that anywhere are scarce. Uh, so we'll have to think about that. Uh, maybe we will do some some printing of articles or mailing of things or encouraging of using interlibrary loan from local public libraries or other institutions that our students are affiliated with. And then we'll we'll do kind of a hybrid of these items that are available long-term and then available just while they're enrolled. But our goal will be to find as much as we can to have that provided freely, uh, not only while they're enrolled, but while the students are out uh, after they complete their degrees. So as we move forward with our development of programming, um, two programs, two significant robust programs that already have a, a significant core of resources that are associated with buying books at the, at the bookstore and reading articles that professors provide. Um, we, are, we are encouraged by the response of, of, re, of the <clears throat> amount of resources we've been able to find. And, and as you can see in that presentation slide when we went through and looked at those resources, um, that Linda and her team, mostly Linda, has already curated for us for our Bible studies and our divinity courses, um, or excuse me, our doctrine courses, that there's a lot of resources that are already out there. And so that has given us hope, but that has also allowed us to have some critical conversations with our faculty already um, as we're moving forward with designing our CBTE program of assuring them it's there, don't worry, we'll find it together. Um, but then it also allows us to en engage with our, our faculty in a different way to really think about how we can continue to support these students who are at a distance, who are completely at a distance. Uh, and that's also new for us. Most of our graduate students, even though they're online, were undergraduates on campus at some point in time. So they have some familiarity with our campus. This will be our first group of students who are never ever potentially going to set their foot on our campus. And so thinking through not only the OER resources, but how we digitize some of our other resources, like our student handbooks um, and our field experience guides for our student teachers before they, they do their student teaching. Um, all of those resources need to be created in a different way and shared with students in a different way. And a PDF, we all know, um, is not always accessible. So as we are moving forward, we're very excited and eager um, to begin the conversation with all of you uh, for your questions, suggestions, and observations uh, as we engage in this process moving forward. Um, I'm going to share the last slide that has our contact information on it, so you can always reach out to us. Um, and then I'm actually going to stop the PowerPoint slide um, in a moment so we can see all of you um, and engage with you in that conversation. So with that, Holly, I think uh, I think I did see one question come through, but I don't know if there are others. There's just the one question currently in the chat. I will go ahead and unmute all the attendees. It may not let me unmute. Uh, if you want to just continue to put your questions in the chat, and then if you want to read the questions from the chat, we'll go that route. So Tamara, um, we have not found that we need to write much of the material um, thus far, um, primarily because we're focused on our CBTE minor right now, and 
the authors of the sort of materials that are openly available sometimes are our faculty. Um, and so we're telling them, look, the resource that you have publicly available really would work in your class. So let's use that. It's there. Um, for our education classes, though, I know Linda has been doing a lot of work um, to find resources already for our education program, which we're not starting to build until next summer. Uh, and so we have a little bit of time until June 2024 to begin to curate those resources. So I'll let Linda speak a little bit about what she's been finding and the wealth of resources that are there. Yeah, I, th I think we may get to a point uh, where, where there's a lot available, but maybe it's not the right things, um, the specific things, because we'll be trying to match so closely uh, the things that that our students have available here and that they're learning because the classes for the education piece will be kind of a one to one match from place to place. Um, so doing a lot of investigation. Um, some of it could come down to. Our faculty here who are using resources that they've developed on their own. Uh, maybe they'll be willing to make those available in a similar fashion to the students who are in the online cohort. Um, but yeah, it, it it could be a challenge. We, we haven't encountered it for the things we've looked at for yet, but I imagine at some point we're going to get there. And, you know, if, if people have suggestions or ideas of where to find the good stuff, I, I'm all ears. Like I said, I was uh, when Nicole came to me with this, I was pretty new to this idea of OER um, and a little behind the eight balls. So I certainly appreciate any suggestions that attendees have. I think to add to that, one of the challenges uh, we have that we've been thinking through is, and I was kind of excited in the keynote to hear about the knives. I know that sounds very strange, um, but we have a significant resource library within our library specifically for manipulatives and course lesson planning and resources that the students who are traditional college students who are here on campus can access before or during their student teaching semester so they can have those preparatory materials to support them as they're going out to do their student teaching semester and we've been thinking of ways that we could replicate that online and I know Linda has very generously offered that maybe some of her library student workers would be interested in helping to create some of those resources in a more digitized fashion. So in those instances, I think there is going to need to be us doing some of that labor and sharing it out. But I think there's also such a upswell in OER that as we move forward, we're going to find that in many cases, our needs are there. And that's also the beauty of OER, right? It allows us to remix and reuse. And so if there's something in that in that textbook that doesn't align, with what we're teaching, we can just focus on the chapters we need to and add those sections that are more relevant to us. So that's exciting as well. A conversation we haven't had maybe with faculty yet, but uh, you know, there's more and more assignments that are being given in places where maybe those students doing the assignments are actually creating materials that can be built onto by their by their peers in the future. So we may have kind of a natural way of accomplishing some of these things throughout our coursework. Um, and we'll just have to find key faculty who are willing to, to work with us to brainstorm. What, one thing that's maybe good about us uh, being a pretty frugal campus uh, overall is that people are in the mindset of how do we find resources that are affordable for our students. Uh, so. So there may be some openness to, to thinking outside the box and being a little creative in how we come up with these things. And we are also a Google school. So while we have the resource that Linda shared for curating those resources, which I can go back to if anyone would like to see it in greater detail, um, but we also leverage Google sites and we have some pretty stellar people within our ITS or Inter information technology services or IT department that are really really comfortable and fluent in using those resources. So when it gets to the point where a faculty member says, no, I want to create something, we already have a platform for doing that um, and being able to share it both internally with our students, but then externally too, if we wanted to.
I there think was another question um, from Amy in the chat. Could you mention the name of the open source online resource guide platform you're using, the one like LibGuides? Yeah. yeah, it's called Subjects Plus. Uh, it was developed, I believe, at the University of Florida. Um, and Nicole will bring it back up here for us to look at. I, I, I haven't used LibGuides. Like I said, we do a lot of things cheaply here. Um, so, but I, I believe it does similar things where you set up these boxes and have and the resources and have them flow through. So it's it we're about three versions behind. We'll be updating that. We need to do some CSS work, but the bones of it are there. And um, it was a little learning curve to it because it it doesn't have great documentation. But if anyone's interested in doing it, um, it can be. Downloaded on the techie people know GitHub. I believe that's where the files live. Um, and if you'd have any questions about how to use it or the ways that we're using it, I'd certainly be able to um, be willing to answer some questions and talk through some things. Right. And I, this is my PC, so you can see all the the links that I've already clicked on and, and checked out. But let's if we because of the way they're organized and this, we did run this by our student workers, right? And they, I think we did over this, over the summer. I can't remember. And we can do some link <laughs> checking. There's a very easy way to do link checking to be sure they work. We'll see if they all still work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's the resource. So it's very easy to navigate and very easy to connect to and faculty can link directly to these, this resource as well in their class. Um, and for this program, we're using D2L for our LMS program. So I think I saw some more questions coming in or comments while I was sharing. So it's okay, I'll stop the share um, and go back. Good. I'm, I'm glad you think we're on the right track with, <laughs> with uh, having our students who are, you know, really they're the experts in uh, the current methods and things. When I got my teaching degree, that was more years ago than I want to want to talk about. Um, so, and our student workers are so beneficial to us in even saying, you know, this will be useful or no, nobody's going to look at this or yeah, this is this is a platform or this is a way that that would be great. Uh, so we bounce a lot of ideas off them too um, to see if we're on the right track with things. Of course, our our learners in this new program will be uh, not traditional age students, so we'll have to consider that uh, that the their comfort with technology may be at a different level than is with the uh, the eighteen and nineteen and twenty year old students we have on campus. Yeah, only think too when we're talking about the other. Um... The other tool that people have a variety of, uh, and I hesitate to bring it up, but when we think about like chat GPT or AI and those issues, when you tell students that this is something that has greater value beyond the class and make it a more authentic assessment that also often drives a different experience, it won't, it won't take away from those people who are looking for the quick solution, but it might help to help them to see differently how their resources could be used and how their, their what they create for the class has a, a bigger audience than than just the professor, and then that has an impact on the level of interest they have in the assignment. Sometimes, I think that we caught up with all of the questions and comments. Um, but if there are others, we're open to continuing that conversation. And Angela, you found the right link there. That that looks right. And if anyone is interested in seeing other instances of Subjects Plus, um, what some other colleges have done with that, other institutions, I've kind of been gathering some of those too, so I'd be happy to share them out. They're a little hard to find oh, other places that are using that platform. Hello. If no one has any other questions, I just want to thank our presenters today for the information and your time. And then I want to thank all the attendees as well for attending today. And I did put Linda's direct email in the chat. 
um, just so since we took that slide down, uh, if you did want to reach out for those resources, um, just reach out to Linda. Thank you very much, everyone. I will end the recording now.